Now, at the present moment, uh, the Taliban control about a quarter of the country, mostly in the rural areas. District centers and districts have fallen to the Taliban in increasing numbers in recent times. But the provincial centers like um, Kandahar in the south and Mazar Sharif in the north, and of course the national capital, uh, Kabul, are very much still in the control of the democratically elected government. So the issue is not settled. It's settled insofar as Western forces led by the Americans have decided that we can do all that we can do on the ground after 20 years and are leaving. But there's a critical point here. They may have prevailed, we may have left, but history does not stop. This story, this tragic story continues. And a particularly important factor is that the Taliban have now lost their raison d'etre. Their battle cry was to rid Afghanistan of Western forces, of foreign forces, to get our Judeo-Christian boots off their Islamic soil. Well, we've gone now. So what is the issue that they are fighting for? The issue is to dominate Afghanistan. They control a quarter of the country. Three quarters are controlled by other people. So the issue now, as it has been for the last several years while we've tried to support them, is will the will of the Afghan people, will the morale of the Afghan national security forces stand up sufficiently to hold off the Taliban from taking control again? I mean, let's face it. The regime 20 years ago was pretty foul. You had your hands cut off for thieving. You were stoned to death for adultery. I don't think the majority of the people of Afghanistan want to go back to that. So the ball is very much in the court of the Afghan people. Is, is do they it, want though? to go back to the days, the dark days of the Taliban, mm. or do they want to enjoy what we've given them a glimpse of? As you said in your introduction, women and children get educated. Women have got a better place in society. There's the potential for a better future for Afghanistan. It's their fight now. If they want to seize the opportunity, they've got to take it. They've never been left alone to forge their own destiny, though, have they? Well, maybe not never, but certainly in, in recent decades, if not centuries, uh, Afghanistan has been a plaything for others, whether it's the strategic depth that the Pakistanis crave, uh, whether it was uh, part of Russia's, the Soviet Empire's ideological ambitions, uh, the Turks are now involved there. Other countries are always looking to get involved in Afghanistan. That's part of its misery. Well, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. But um, I will cast your mind in historic terms back to before the 1979 uh, invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviet Union. There was a period when people of my generation in their gap years between school and university went on the so-called hippie trail. And one of the places they would go to was Kabul and Afghanistan. And in the days of the king in the 1970s, there was a relatively peaceable society in Afghanistan. So, yes, the popular image is of Afghanistan always being fought over and fought within, and, that, and undoubtedly their history shows that. But there have been periods of peace. There have been periods of prosperity. And I think the struggle now for the people of Afghanistan is do they want to go back, to fall back under the thumb of the Taliban and that very difficult regime that we got rid of 20 years ago, or do they want to fight for a better future? This is an opportunity for them. It's, it's a great pity that international forces have left. But that doesn't mean to say that the international community has left. Diplomatic efforts, economic investment will continue. Um, you've suggested in your introduction that special forces may continue to operate there. Um, we don't speculate about that, but I'd be surprised if, if that was not the case. So, yes, the Taliban have prevailed at the present moment. We have left but it's not done and dusted. Let's actually hope and pray that the uh, sacrifice of the 456 British servicemen and women who lost their lives in Afghanistan will not ultimately prove to be in vain. They did their duty extraordinarily well, but let's see what happens over the next few weeks, months and years. It's not done and dusted, and it might have a better outcome than perhaps the doomsters today might suggest. We, we remember the fallen, of course. Um, can we consider, though, the impact on the army that you commanded? Is there a feeling that we started badly and got better? And if so, what are the lasting lessons that we take away from it? Undoubtedly, the experiences of the Afghanistan campaign and the Iraq campaign have produced a British army that is 
battle hardened, very experienced. Junior leaders have become very experienced leaders. They've become more senior leaders. So actually the little British army that you referred to at about 72,000, um, the strength it'll shortly be, is much smaller than it's been in recent history by, by a country mile. But it's an extraordinarily well-trained, well-led, well-motivated army. And um, without making too much of a, a partisan point, I'd like to see it slightly better equipped because investment from the defense budget has predominantly gone uh, into the Navy for good reasons, aircraft carriers uh, and the like, uh, and into the Royal Air Force, expensive fast jets, and the Army invariably in equipment terms um, comes up rather short. But um, our Army has served this nation proudly, as it always has done, and it will do so in the future, but a bit more investment wouldn't half help.